Are you ready for the word? Amen. All right. I, I, I've had this growing thing on my heart about how we view the Father. And, and I have heard it said many times that because of what Jesus did for you on the cross, when God looks at you, God looks at you through a Jesus lens. And so what that statement, I think, is supposed to mean is that you are what you are and all of your failures and flaws, and then Jesus dies and raises again and is, is seated metaphorically at the right hand of the Father. I don't think Jesus is on some literal chair in a place called heaven because he's on the throne of your heart. And so that God then is looking through his sort of the Jesus lens to see you. And I think in maybe my formative days of teaching the finished work and grace, I probably would have said that, and I definitely would have amen that. I thought that that was a good way of viewing us because, you know, who are we? A bunch of sinners in need of a Savior. And if God can look at me through those Jesus lens, but I, I think we got it backwards. See, I don't think God needs a lens to look at you. You are a new creation in Christ. You are not some sinner saved by grace someone just stumbling around in the world crossing your fingers when you talk to the father that hopefully he's looking at you through his jesus eyes today no i think it's the opposite i think that we need to put on our jesus glasses to see the father correctly in other words we need to look at the father through what we see in a man named jesus so we have this perception of god and we all know it's erroneous for the most part. Just, just ask somebody what they think of God or can they describe God or where is God? And you get a bunch of bogus stuff and most of us could probably contribute to that foolishness pretty easily. So, you know, where's God? What is God? Who is God? And we can even pull good facts out of the Bible. I mean, good, you can pull Old Testament facts about God. They're facts. They're in there. And yet we know it's not the nature of the Jesus that we see walking the shores of Galilee. We, we don't see Jesus smiting people down with lightning rods from heaven and lightning bolts. In fact, they asked Jesus, you want us to call down fire like Elijah? And Jesus' famous reply was, "What? you don't know what spirit is driving you. That's pretty big. I mean, that's the same spirit that drove Elijah. And Jesus said, you don't want that. You want something else. And so I think it's a matter of putting on that and this is a crude illustration, but it's the best I got. Putting on those Jesus glasses to see the Father. It's like looking at God through who Jesus is. It sounds a little bit like this. In John 1.18, the Bible says, No man has seen God at any time. That's pretty straightforward. Most people are okay with that. No man has seen God at any time. But he who is in the bosom of the Father, that we start to struggle with. Because that makes God pretty feminine. Because it is what it sounds like. He who comes from the breast of the Father. And if the Father creates woman, he's just as much mother as he is Father. There's a good mind blower for most people in the church. How is that possible? So you have the Father who from his breast brings forth his Son. This tender, this, this tender root, the Old Testament would call him. This precious and it says, and he displays the Father. Let's put all that together again. No man's seen God at any time, but he who is in the bosom of the Father has displayed him to us. Jesus displays the Father to us because we've never seen God. So you want to know what God looks like? We look at Jesus, and then we see the Father displayed. And so when you have Jesus responding to scenarios and conditions and, and things in, the, in his earthly ministry, then you have Jesus trying to put on display what Daddy really looks like. It's like this is who my Father is. I don't care what you think you know about God. I want you to see him as father and this is what he looks like. And so that's why I say you're sort of putting on those Jesus lenses so that you can identify the father. You can see, because I think the great black eye is that God has been misunderstood. I don't mean God misunderstands us. I mean, we have misunderstood God. We've misunderstood our father and his love and his passion and his compassion for us. Go with me with an illustrated thought here just for a moment. Just think about this. You as a parent, okay? And you have your kids and you give your life for your kids, okay? We're out of the gate. We're right on the money. That's what all of us have done. Mm -hmm. You give your whole life to your kids. You give your whole life to raising them. You give your whole life to 
feeding them and clothing them and doing what's best for them and keeping them safe and providing for them and, and maybe even lay your life down for them. I mean, literally lay your life down on their behalf. And you step in when they're in trouble and you help them where you can and you, you try to make life a little better for them or at least a little less terrible, right? I mean, they're your kids. So if you can stop something awful from happening, you stop it. And if you can make good things happen for them, you make good things happen. But you don't stop everything because that wouldn't make you a good parent. You know, you, you, you do what you can here and there, but you, you don't stop every scenario and you don't stop every bad thing and you don't stop every problem. You hold their hand and you have good conversations with them and you talk to them about how to survive these issues. And then as they grow older, and let's just stay with that illustration for a moment, that train of thought. Maybe they look back on all the moments and all they remember is not where you did help them or where you did make it easier. They just remember the moments you didn't. The moments you didn't help them and the moments you didn't make it easier, the moments you didn't step in and intervene and solve all of their problems. And so they start to think that those are the moments that define you and the way you feel about them. The moments you didn't do anything. Well, that's who my dad was. That's who my mom was. Because I can tell you this moment happened and they weren't there. And that moment happened and they didn't do anything. You don't list the 98, 99, 100 other times when all the things happened that you did to save them or spare them or release them or free them. And then as you grow older, you get distance and you don't talk as much because that's what it's all about, right? I mean, they grow up and get married and have kids and move away. And even though you might be texting and FaceTiming and talking, your relationship's not what it was when they were six and ten. That would be weird. I mean, if they're still living at home in the basement and they've hit middle age, you, you have bigger problems than communication. And so you, you have this this expanse for lack of a better term that starts to happen and and let's let's act like for a moment that the child starts to view that as separation they start to view that as isolation and as you grow further and further apart and that distance happens they start to look at that as disapproval the fact that we aren't talking like we used to talk start to take that to heart for long nobody knows each other I think this is what we've done to God. You see, I think God who's given everything for us and who loves us and who sacrificed it all for us and who maneuvers and helps and blesses and favors and keeps you from some junk and blesses you in other moments. And yet what we do is we spot the moment God doesn't take the cancer away or the moment God didn't make sure we got the raise or the moment that this bad thing happens and we only see that and we say if God were something different if God were something better if God were something loving then he would do this for me and we start to accent and think only on those moments where there is some perceived gap and then we start to take the gap as disapproval and we start to take all the bad stuff as God doing it to us so that he can get our attention or he can teach us a lesson well that would rip your heart out as a parent if you thought that's the way your child viewed you simply because the world's a tough place to live in and i think that's the father he looks at us and sees all of our stuff we live in a world full of good and evil and that's i really want to dwell there tonight but the Bible gives us a phenomenal microcosm of the walk that you have with God. It's called the children of Israel. If you ever want to know what the purpose of that Old Testament is, not only is it showing you Jesus in shadow, he's in there. You've got you to look for him, but you find him. He's in there beautifully, and it's your privilege to go mine him out of the text of the Old Testament. But one of the beautiful things about the Old Testament is that if you watch Israel's journey, and we'll, we'll go to the garden in a moment, but if you watch Israel's journey in this even just from Sinai on, I mean, you, got, you come out of Egypt, that's phenomenal. You cross the Red Sea, but if you just go Sinai on and you watch this journey through that wilderness, you see so much of how we respond to God and how he responds to us. Think about for a moment the children of Israel, maybe they're three million strong. I don't know. Scholars throw numbers from 600,000 to three million Israelites. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is you got an entire race of people subjugated in slavery to, to Egypt and have been for four centuries. And 
they, they, they're holding on to their heritage and they're holding on to their past, but better yet, they're holding on to a promise that there's a land out there that belongs to us and that our God will get us there. And we don't know how he's going to do it and it's impossible for him to do it because somebody else owns us and we don't have an army and we can't rise up in an insurrection. So how are we ever going to inherit what belongs to us? And then, of course, God steps in and here comes ten plagues and God delivers his people with the blood over the doorposts and the door mantle. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you start to get all this New Testament imagery they don't know it's new testament you do you're looking back on it and here god brings them out of egypt and marches them to the red sea and there's the egyptian army behind them and the red sea in front of them and god says to moses don't look back always look forward my people always look forward and speak to the red sea and the waters part and israel crosses over on dry ground and the egyptians are drowned beneath the waves and israel gets across the water and whines about having no water and Israel gets across the water and whines about having no food and it's a microcosm of our journey with God you did so much good for me but why have you forsaken me now why in the middle of this great moment of turmoil have you left me alone it's amazing when you watch that journey how quickly we descend into this chaotic state of thinking that God has become our enemy. When Paul writes, if God be for us, who can be against us? We rally around that. We put it on banners and sing worship songs to it. But for the Jews reading Roman, the book of Romans, it was a cry that they had to really work at to swallow because they didn't believe God had always been for them. So Paul's given a revolution there. If God's for you, who can be against you? And the argument would have been how to... How do we know God's always been for us? Because look at this junk that's happened. And so we spiraled downward so fast. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 1. I don't know how many of you brought a Bible. If you didn't bring one, shame on you. No, no, no. That's, that's not true. <clears throat> if you didn't bring one, that's okay. You probably got a digital edition. Or I'll read really slow. And that will help you. Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm going to start in 25. I just want to read three verses out of the gate. I want to remind you of this. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and chapter 2, actually the whole book of Deuteronomy is a recap of the journey of Israel to, to, to just before they go into the promised land, okay? However, the first couple of chapters are really detailed, really good stuff about Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is the, is the last stop at the Jordan, and on the other side of the Jordan is the land that flows with milk and honey. And so there's this gap this journey between Sinai and there of about 40 years, remember. Actually, between Sinai and, and Kadesh Barnea is about two weeks. It's 40 years from that moment forward because they don't cross in and take the land. Now, <clears throat> the descent from... Cause, let me think about this, guys. You watch God part an ocean, a sea, and you cross it on dry ground, and the people who have put your family in slavery for 400 years, drown behind you in the waves. You didn't lift a finger. You don't know how to fight. You don't even own a sword. And yet God is doing this for you. You get thirsty, water starts shooting out of a rock and you drink it and it's good. You get hungry, you wake up, God's put fresh food on the ground outside of your house. You don't even have to plant crops. We're actually talking about the road to laziness. And there's an actual very important message there in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Because it is a lot easier to just have people tell you what to do than it is to follow the Holy Spirit. But that's for another sermon. One you've heard many times. And so there's the free food and there's the free water and there's obviously free military because we don't fight anybody and yet we're not losing any battles. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 25, they go across and spy out the land and they say this, they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and they brought it back to us and they brought back word to us saying it's a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. In other words, the land that flows with milk and honey is great and we ought to go take it. Nevertheless, you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God and complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Please catch that phrase. This was what Israel said when they got to the promised land. Because the Lord hates us, 
He brought us out of Egypt to kill us. Now, I want to recap for you real quickly what's just happened to Israel. He brought them out of the land of Egypt, and he brought them out wealthier than they went in, and not one poor, weak, or feeble was among their tribes when they walked out. Not one sick, not one lame, not one paralytic, not one hungry belly walked out. They walked out rich and full. They didn't lift a finger to do it. They get to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry ground. Their enemies are drowned behind them. Now no one is chasing you. There's nothing but beautiful destiny and horizon in front of you. There is no one on your tail. You get thirsty, I'll smack rocks, water will come out of them. You get hungry, I'll bring down quail and bread. It'll set outside the tent flap of your house. You don't have to do anything but open the door and take it in and go cook it whatever way you like, and it'll taste great, and there'll be more of it tomorrow. (laughs) And then when they get to the land that God has promised them, they cross over, and what do they find? Grapes so large. They have to carry, they carry them back in loads and hordes, and they say, you won't believe the size of the fruit in the land that God has given us. And yet... I'm not really sure that we can take it. I'm not really sure it's time yet. You know what? In fact, God must hate us to drag us out here and put us up next to the land of promise so that we can die at the hands of our enemies. And I read it every time and I can't figure out how they ended up here. And yet I watch as people disparage the name of Jesus, talk bad about God, And for what good reason? We're not looking at the favor in our lives. We're not looking at the blessings in our lives. We're not looking at the provision in our lives. We're looking at those little moments of gap. Those little moments where maybe we were supposed to be learning a lesson. Or maybe we were supposed to learn how to orient ourselves in the world. Or maybe if we had taken time to think it over and pray about it and consider, there was something there we actually could have done. Because we're not living in the old covenant. We're living in the new. And we don't just live off of dead quail and chunks of bread on the ground we get to plant our own crops and become entrepreneurial and and do great things and there are going to be moments in their frustration how would we end up with god must hate me what would have to happen for us to end up with god must hate me to put me in this place okay i don't know because i've never been there i've never perceived that god hates me but i hear it from people all the time maybe not in those stark words but at least we end up atheists and agnostics and it's always because there's no loving god that lets a little kid die of cancer that's usually the starting blocks so let's go ahead and start there there's no loving god that lets bad things happen to good people and there's no loving god that keeps bad things from happening to bad people because what kind of a loving god will let these people get off with this if there were a god Why doesn't the gun jam when the school shooter walks into an elementary school and puts the crosshairs on little kids and all God has to do is reach down and mess up the gun? Pretty easy for God. He can drown the Egyptians in the Red Sea. Why can't He stop this chaos from happening to us? And so what do we do? We step back and say, I don't understand the gaps. I don't understand the moments of silence and therefore God must hate me Or it comes out like this. I don't understand all this stuff, so therefore there must not be a God. He doesn't exist, and if He does, He's not very loving. And if He's not very loving, I wouldn't want nothing to do with Him anyway. And I've heard many people who end right there. And for them, that's enough of an experience to not believe any scripture you quote. All right? They've already got that. Because you can't show me that verse why God let that kid die. You can't show me that verse why... I'm not so sure we can't if we'll just change the way we view the Bible for a moment. Because you see, the book of Genesis unfolds not, and this is where we've messed up in fundamental Christianity. The book of Genesis unfolds not as a book about man's history. It's not a chronological retelling of the journeys of man's history. It's a book of stories trying to make sense of who we are as a people, trying to understand why we have a conscience, why we treat our neighbor the way that we do. It's why in the very opening pages of the book we see everything from sexuality, reproduction, dealing with our siblings, dealing with our parents, murder, lust, drunkenness, envy from our earliest time of scratching pen across paper. We were trying to make sense of why 
We're doing the things we're doing. What we've done in Christianity is we've pulled those stories in and went, okay, let's try to find out where this happened in human history. And then we get in a big argument about whether or not God created the earth in six days, and we miss the point. And so we're all out looking for Noah's Ark, trying to figure out if it was a real boat. Maybe we found it, and then we can prove that the Bible's real. And none of that stuff is to prove the Bible's real because they weren't writing about a boat and a murder to try to help you set up your chronological history book. They were trying to help you understand who you are and why you are the way that you are, why you think the way you think. And so when you get Adam and Eve walking through a garden and there's two trees, it's man trying to tell the story. We could have went one way and we went another. And what if we had went the other way? So we didn't. We go tree of the knowledge of good and evil and here comes the serpent. And how many of you know that in your garden of paradise, there's always a snake? See, Genesis is trying to get you to think that way too. In your garden of paradise, there's always a dragon, and you're going to have to kill him, or you're going to have to learn how to talk to him. You're going to have to learn how to overcome him. And it's not without Jesus. Of course, we know through the new covenant who Christ is and what he does in that garden. But that story is real and relevant for us to understand that. And so let's, do, let's just try that on for a minute. Let's take that lens for a second. Okay? Man faces a tree. God says, don't eat that one. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Man faces another tree. God says, you can eat them all. There's the tree of life. Man never even seems tempted to go after the tree of life. So I'm not trying to preach theology into why he doesn't. It's the story that is to try to help you to understand what happened to us and why we are what we are. And so, of course, the serpent talks to Eve, and Eve eats the fruit, and Eve passes the fruit to Adam, and then God brings the comes into the cool of the day and begins to talk to Adam. And I don't need to re-preach the garden experience for you. You understand this? I have a theory. God puts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, not because he doesn't want man, not because it's off limits for man. It is temporarily off limits. He also puts the tree of life in the garden. God has the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil doesn't seem to be a problem. In fact, the book of Isaiah says, and a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And that child, before he knows the difference between good and evil, dot, dot, dot. You can fill in the blanks later and go read that. In other words, God knew that even Jesus would learn the difference in good and evil. Even Jesus would grow into that understanding. So the knowledge of good and evil is not a problem. We've almost preached the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as if God didn't ever want you to understand evil. No, good and evil exist as two sides of the same coin. They have to. Because you don't know what good is if you don't know what evil is. And you don't know what evil is if you don't know what good is. If I say to you, is that shirt clean? And you look at that shirt. How do you know if that shirt is clean? It's really simple. It's not dirty. Did you notice the criterion for clean is? It's just straight up not dirty. Well, how do you know what dirty is? Well, I know what, what it would look like if it were dirty. The fact that it doesn't look dirty tells me it must be clean. How did you determine clean? The definition is it just doesn't anything dirty there. <laughs> now, that plays out in our life every day because where we celebrate good, we do so because we've noticed the absence of evil and where we have the presence of evil, we wish we had good. Now, that's not something that God's played some wicked trick on you. That's how we define life. That's order and chaos. It's like a hurricane. It refreshes the atmosphere, but you don't want them 365 a year. No. The atmosphere is not refreshed anymore. It's just everybody's dead. Yeah. <laughs> so a little chaos goes a long way. A little order is restored. Things are better. And so man faces that tree, eats from that tree, and of course we go in that downward spiral. I don't believe it was God's plan that man not know the difference between good and evil. I think it was God's plan that man learned the difference between good and evil by following the Holy Spirit, not following the system of the world. And here's why I believe that, because the book of Hebrews says those who are spiritually mature know how to discern between good and evil. Did you catch that? They know how to discern the difference between good and evil. Well, that sounds, I mean, every man has to deal with good and evil, but those who are walking in the spirit understand how to discern good and evil. They understand the difference in good and evil. And I don't believe that good and evil and right and wrong are necessarily the same thing. And slow down right here for a moment. I want to make sure that soaks in. I want to take you on a little journey. Most of us are raising our kids to know the difference between right and wrong. 
Most of us don't do much talking about the difference between good and evil because we think they're the same thing. Jesus didn't. In Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees come to Jesus and accuse him and his disciples of doing things on the Sabbath day, a day in which God told you you're not supposed to work. And Jesus said, let me ask you a question. When David went into the temple and he ate the showbread that only the high priest is supposed to be able to eat, why was he able to do that? He said, well, let me ask you another question. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, and yet every one of you do the duties of the synagogue every Saturday. How do you get by with that? What was Jesus doing? Jesus just told you two things that were wrong. Mm -hmm. Was it right for David to go in and eat the showbread if only the high priest is supposed to eat the, sh the showbread? By the way, David was not a high priest. No, he was not. So by rule, by law, and law always leans to legalism, mm -hmm. how can it not? Black and white's black and white, yeah. right? Break the law, you're in trouble. So Jesus said, David goes in and eats the showbread. He's not supposed to eat the showbread. Was it wrong for David to eat the showbread? Yeah. Yes. Correct answer. It was wrong for David to eat the showbread. But it would have been evil for him not to eat the showbread. See the difference? It was good in that moment. So I think we get a little, I only shared that with you because I think we get a little too locked up on rights and wrongs and not carefully enough following the Holy Spirit to good and evil. Because rights and wrongs tend to shift, good and evil doesn't. Okay? Right and wrong even shifts generationally, it shifts culturally. Good and evil doesn't shift. Because good's going to be according to covenant, it's going to be the heart of God. Evil's going to be a breach of that. It's going to be against the heart of God. Wrong doesn't always bring chaos. Evil always brings chaos. Because that's all evil knows to do. And so all around you every day are a bunch of problems and a bunch of issues and a bunch of things. But here's the point. If man can't have evil in the world and good in the world, then you don't have free will and you don't have liberty. Because liberty, why even put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there? Because it has to exist. It has to exist that the opposite of good is evil. So that when you see God and you see good, you can spot God in anything good. So it becomes easy. If it's good, it's God. I like what my friend John Sheesby says. If it's good, it's God. If it ain't good, it ain't God. I can't say it any better. I didn't say if it's right. I said if it's good. And that's up. we're learning to follow that and determine that by listening to the Holy Spirit. So free will is really the ability to have both. Now that's difficult because liberty is dangerous. Okay? I mean, liberty is really dangerous. If you set people free, that's a dangerous society because people can make bad decisions. So, well, I'd just like to live in a society where no one can make bad decisions. No, you don't. No, no, you don't want to live in a society where no one can make bad decisions. Do you know what society that is? A society where your very thoughts, actions, words, and deeds are dictated by someone who's determined what is right and what is wrong. And you don't have the liberty to do that. They tell you that. Tell you where to work, how to spend your money, what to wear, what to say, what not to say. It's not just about freedom of speech. You, you get into compulsive. You have to talk this way. You can't talk that way. You have to do this. You can't do that. Well, it would be a lot better if, the, if we just had the right people in power. And that's, I think, a very dangerous precipice we're dancing on right now, too. Is this idea that it wouldn't be so bad for someone to have a bunch of power if it were just the right someone. And we've seen a lot of chaos happen in the world because we kept just trying to fill that vacuum with the right someone. Maybe we just get the right person in there. And then, and then what a lot of us Christians are doing is just taking a step back going, well, someday Jesus will be the one on the throne. And here's the, here's the dark part of our prophecy. Jesus will be on the throne and they'll all get theirs. Yeah. Which is, I think is, another, is an incorrect way of thinking of your Jesus. Jesus gets on there, he'll, he'll, he'll straighten them all out. <laughs> now, let me tell you why I came to this conclusion. I, I'm, I'm digging around the book of Revelation, and I'm watching how the, the whole, because I think the book of Revelation is really the end of that, is, that, that Jewish economy. I think, it is the, I think it's a message to seven real churches in Asia a long, long time ago about stuff that was about to happen to them shortly at hand. So close, don't seal the book. That's how it ends. It's so close, don't seal the book. 
Revelation is not your future. In fact, guys, Daniel gets to the end of his book and God goes, seal it. It's going to take a long time for this stuff to happen. 400 years later, Jesus is quoting Daniel. 400 years, a long time. Book of Revelation. Don't seal it. It's about to happen. Okay, so it must have been about to happen. I'm just going to take him at his word. At hand, pretty close. So I'm reading through Revelation, and I, and I get to the end, and I watch how we get introduced. Because the angel says to John, you want to see, see what the bride looks like? So I go, ooh, that's, that's good. I, I want to see what the bride looks like. I mean, don't you? We, we brag about being the bride of Christ. And he said, so I looked up, and I saw a city come down from God out of heaven, the new Jerusalem. And inside of that city was trees that ran down a river, a river of life, river of living water. And everyone who tasted of those leaves, they were for the healing of the nations. And that water brought life. And its gates were open. And there were no one allowed in the city that was a whoremonger and fearful and abominable and afraid and lack of faith and unbelieving. But the gates were open. People could come in and out day and night. And then the book of Revelation ends. I couldn't figure out why all those sinners were still on the planet, yeah. hanging outside of the New Jerusalem. You got all those fearful that's not allowed in, and then there's Revelation. See, because I don't think the book of Revelation is trying to tell you about a city coming up that's going to set on the planet. I think it's trying to tell you about a city that Jesus said to his disciples, you are a city set on a hill. You are at Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 12. You are at Mount Zion, to the city of the firstborn, to the angels, to Jesus, to God the judge and Jesus the mediator, to the spirits of just men made perfect. You're not going there, you're there. And so when you look at the new Jerusalem, you're looking at you and me, you're looking at these who have inside of us what Jesus said in John 17. If any man believe on me, he shall have within him rivers of living water that shall spring up inside of him. Where's that river? That's that river that flows through new Jerusalem. What about those leaves, that tree, that's life. That tree of life we'd lost access to in Eden, but we gained access to in another garden. Remember when Jesus said, as it is written, they'll smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter? Jesus goes to the cross, they kill the shepherd, the sheep all scatter. That prophecy comes in the book of Zechariah, where God says, wake up, sword, and smite the shepherd. What sword needed to wake up? The same sword that had been asleep in the Garden of Eden since the beginning of Genesis, guarding the way to the tree of life, the tree that we bypassed so that we could determine our conscience based upon our own actions instead of following the Spirit. But at Calvary, that sword smote Jesus so that you and I could have access to the tree of life, a tree that still grows inside of you and me. So you have the answer. You're not on your way to the answer. You are the answer. Revelation ends with a bunch of sinners outside the New Jerusalem because we're supposed to be allowing them in to eat from the tree and we're supposed to be taking the leaves out to heal the nations and we're supposed to be allowing the water to touch the world. My point is this. I don't think we're rapidly heading towards a day where no one can make a wrong decision. That's not how the Bible ends. We're not rapidly heading towards a day where there's no more stuff going wrong. It's time that we start living in a day where you and I represent the grace of God, the love of the Father, and the good that is in God to a people who are convinced that God doesn't love them and God doesn't care and maybe there is no God at all. And as we start to represent the God of love and the God of compassion, the God with a little bit of humility and a little bit of empathy, instead of a lot of what we present in the church, when we start to present that God, and people see that God. I'm not saying we're going to turn every atheist or every agnostic on to Jesus, but we're fighting losing battles oftentimes because we're not putting Jesus in the center of the argument to show that Jesus frames the argument about who God really is. And you're never really going to know it until you look to Jesus, until you see who He is. So freedom is dangerous. So let me go back to a couple of questions. Why, God, why doesn't God just jam the gun? Well, because if God steps in and jams the gun, we don't ever understand what liberty really is. We don't ever understand what freedom really is, and freedom is a dangerous way to live. I'd rather live free 
in a dangerous world than to live without freedom in a safe world. Amen. Did you hear that? Yes. So I think we have to live, we have to understand that the purpose of the gospel is not to provide us with an environment only of safety, but an environment of the wisdom of the Spirit. All right. Most of us, if given the chance to make our kids safe or make our kids smart, will always choose to make our kids safe. You should always choose to make your kids smart. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Doves are safe. Serpents are smart. You don't want just one over the other, but you don't want to sacrifice one for the other. So the wisdom is following after that which is good. It's not about rights and wrongs. It's not about trying to identify who's right and who's wrong. But it's about following after good. To do that, we're probably going to have to break down some of our politics. We're probably going to have to get off of one side of the aisle or the other. We're going to have to start looking after good instead of looking after what we think is right or who we think is right. We're going to have to start following that simple and gentle voice of the Spirit after moving after what is good. But God is not in the business of jamming the gun because God loves liberty and it is for freedom that He set us free. There's a, there's, a, there's a laundry list of stuff that needs to happen to the young man holding the gun. The problem is there's probably a laundry list of stuff that didn't happen for the young man holding the gun long before he picked up the gun. And we can't just sit back and say thoughts and prayers. Because we've become irrelevant in the world. Because every time something tragic happens, the best thing we can come up with is thoughts and prayers. And then we just move on to the next news story and probably didn't even do that much praying over it. And if we did, all we ask is for people to get what's coming to them. No. Or for the people that disagrees with us to wise up and start agreeing with us. That's not a prayer. God, change the way that guy thinks so he'll think more like me. Well, that could be all hell breaks loose if that's what ends up happening in the world. Would it ever ask anybody else to think like me? I don't even always like thinking like me. I don't need you doing it too. Israel thought God hated them, and here's my conclusion. Why did they think God hated them? This is, this is a big question we need to answer. Why did they think God hated them so much? Because there was always these little gaps where God, who allows us to walk in liberty and make bad decisions, doesn't step in and stop them. And we go, well, you should have. You must hate me for letting me make that decision. We go, no, I let you make that decision because I love you. And if you're making wrong decisions, don't come back and say, I don't love you because you did something stupid. But why do we end up with God must hate us? Jesus dealt with the same thing. Jesus shows up, John 6, and there's 5,000 people. And Jesus really just wanted to go by, be by himself because his cousin, John the Baptist, just got his head cut off. And Jesus just needed to go spend some alone time. Because that was his family. So Jesus goes off to cry. And, to pr and just to pray and meditate. And a bunch of people show up because that's Jesus. And the story was out that if you can get to Jesus, man, he can do some stuff. And so 5,000 people show up. And the Bible says, and Jesus was moved with compassion on them. That's what a guy. Now that's a shepherd. See, that's an irrational shepherd. That's a love that is not explainable. So you're weeping at your funeral of your closest family member, one of your closest family members, and you walk away to show compassion on those who are hurting and wounded. I don't have that kind of love. And then that, that moves me forward every day. What would that man look like in the earth? Right? What would that man look like if he turned and saw a crowd who were suffering and he was moved with compassion on them? Some of you might saw a clip I put up recently from a message we did in Canada and I, I put a little three minute clip called Humility and Empathy. That was a little moment in the sermon that I sliced out and made on its own because I thought more people might actually listen to it on its own. I really wanted them to hear it. And uh, it was just my little diatribe on what kind of leader I want to see and what kind of leadership I think we lack. And that is humble and empathetic. God give us men and women who are humble and full of empathy and they will change the world. Amen. And I think we lack it in the church and I think we lack it in politics and I think we lack it in Often in the home, the macho culture has turned us into a people who find humility and empathy weak. 
and those chickens will come home to roost. They always do. And you say, well, that's a little too political for me. Okay, just do this. Just always put Jesus in the middle of it. It's not about this corny, what would Jesus do? But it's find the spirit of the man. Okay, the spirit of the man, Christ Jesus, who is weeping over his lost loved one, who turns to 5,000 people he doesn't know. And instead of saying to his disciples, send them home, I'll deal with them tomorrow. Jesus comes to them, heals their sick, raises their lame, exhausts himself, turns to his disciples and says, let's feed them because that's the right thing to do. And the disciples go, we don't have enough food. And Jesus said, well, then go buy it because that would be the right thing to do. And they say, well, we don't have that kind of money. And Jesus says, then give it to me. And when he gets it, I don't think he knows what he's doing. I'm serious. I, this is a, a developmental stage I'm in in walking through the ministry of Jesus. This whole right in the dust move Jesus does in John 8, that's a doodle for time. I'm serious. Now, I, I, that, that really offends some people, so let me take a slow step there. Because I think what happens is Jesus, we've misinterpreted Jesus. Jesus is a man walking by faith. And men walking by faith have to shut their mouths and listen. Okay? And if you don't shut your mouth, you probably don't listen. And so Jesus is confronted. They go, here's a woman. And I know I'm off of my 5,000, but you've been here with me before. <laughs> All right? You've ran that rabbit before. Let's chase him down. And I not going to do any of us any good to let him live. They throw a woman in front of Jesus, and they got rocks in their hands. They're going to, they're going to crack her skull and kill her. Call it what it is. I think we softened it when they were on a stoner to death. They were going to bust her head open until her brains fell out and she died because they caught her committing adultery. The guy got off. Apparently both literally and figuratively. Oh, that's too crude. I didn't write the story down. The word did. The woman's there. She gets nothing out of it but a death sentence. And they say to Jesus, Moses says, we ought to stone her to death. What do you say? And the Bible says that Jesus just doodles. And you can go, well, he's writing down the seventh commandment. Or he's writing grace in the dust. No, he's not. He's stalling. Because when he looks up, he says, well, this is really what he says in the Greek. Go ahead and kill her. If you can. It ain't going to be easy because you're going to have to bust her head open. I mean, you're going to have to stand here and watch her bleed to death. You're going to sleep with that tonight. That's going to be on your conscience till you die. So if you're that kind of man, I guess kill her. And he goes back to doodling. That's, that's my kind of leader. Just, just, just take a minute and doodle if you got to. Follow the Spirit. Jesus goes, you feed her. They go, we ain't got that kind of food. Jesus goes, go buy it. We ain't got that kind of money. Jesus goes, what do you have? And that's all it takes is what do you have? Stop talking about what you don't have. And they go, well, we got this kid's. And I think they laugh when they say it. We got a kid's lunch. What good's that going to do? We got 5,000 people. And that's just the men. They're not counting the women and the children. 15,000 people on the hill. What are you going to do with it? Jesus goes, bring me the kid's lunch. This is why I don't think Jesus knows what's up. I don't think he knows what he's going to do. Because listen to how he prays in John 6. The Bible says he tears it in half, holds it up to the Father, and says, Father, I thank you for what you're about to do. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't say, Father, bring down enough to fill 12 baskets of fragments. Watch the miracle of God. No, he just said, Father, thanks for this. Hands it to his disciples and says, now go hand it out. And they do, and you know the story. And the crowd goes berserk, man. Why wouldn't you? So they go home. I was telling you all this for this reason. How do we descend down to God must hate me? They go home. Jesus goes and prays. The next mo He walks on the water to get from one side of the Galilee to the other. They wake up the next morning. He's not there. So they chase him. They all get in boats and go across the water. And they find Jesus, and they run up to Jesus. And they say to Jesus, Oh, we, we want some more of that bread. And Jesus says to them, your fathers had bread every day in the wilderness, and they're dead. 
But I have a bread that if you'll eat it, you'll never die. And if you'll drink my blood, you'll never thirst again. You came to me not for the words of life that I can speak to you. You came to me for the bread that perishes. In other words, you came to me so I would do another physical miracle. And I want to do a spiritual one. But that's not going to be good enough for you. Because you're on a journey to get a physical miracle. Because you determine my value to you by what I do for you in the natural. And I'm here to tell you that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're never going to have mine or my father's life in you. But if you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have your, our life in you. And what's the Bible say happens next? And most of them went home because they were greatly offended. And Jesus turned to the only 12 that were left. There were 5,000. And he turns to the 12 that are left or the 70 that are left. And he says, will you go also? And Peter says, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We stopped hanging around you a long time ago because you could feed us bread. We hang around you because when you talk, never has a man spoken like this man. We descend into the God hates me mode. There must be no God because all we look for is what God does in the natural realm. And when God stops doing something for us in the natural realm, we've already made a determination about God that is wrong. Does God love you? Absolutely. How do I know? Because he put Jesus at Calvary. Amen. Paul said in Romans 5, 8, God displayed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The great proof of God's love is that God would sacrifice himself because that's the great proof of a parent. How do you know your mom and dad loves you? Look at all the things that are going on in your life, the provision that they provide you. There are going to be moments where they don't stop things from happening to you. If you interpret that, that mom and dad now hate you and trying to teach you a lesson, you miss the point. We got to continue and constantly put Jesus in front of them. Let me read one more passage. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. Go to 38. God's telling you the two people that get to go into the wilderness, Caleb and Joshua. Everybody else is going to die. 38, Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there, encourage him. For he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Always should encourage those who speak to you of your inheritance. That's a good thing. Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it and they shall possess it. Today they have no knowledge of good and evil. They're going to. That's something they're going to grow into. This is a crucial development for this generation going into the wilderness. Something just grabs me about that phrase, you say they will be victims. I'm reading now the New King James. I don't have any idea what the other translations say. I saw that, and that just jumped off the page at me. You say they will be victims. God says they will not be victims. And I think God is teaching us a very crucial lesson. If we keep descending into this, God is against me. God doesn't care. This is what's happening. Here's where we end up. We end up in a pessimistic society that has already prophesied doom for the next generation. And that's how most of us talk about the next generation now. They don't have a chance. Those kids don't have a chance. And God said the same thing. These who you say will be victims. He said they will cross over. And I don't even really know why I'm closing with that, but that's the last thing I want you to hear from me from the scriptures is those, of, those who we look at in the next generation and say we'll be victims. I don't buy it for a second because I believe the message of grace and the love of God is sweeping the earth. Amen. And those who you say will be victims will be victors Amen. in another generation. Amen. Now, I want to live to see it. Yes. Maybe we need to take advantage of the two ears and one mouth and listen twice as much as we talk and doodle in the sand once in a while until we've learned the difference between good and evil maybe we need to lay down our right and wrong and pick up our good and evil because some things are right or some things are wrong but we're looking for good there's a lot more I want to say there's a lot more I could say but I'm going to stop there and I want to do that for a reason, because I, I want to see what the Father is saying to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for dangerous freedom. It is for freedom you set us free. I thank you that you did that, and I thank you that you gave us that dangerous freedom.
is ours and it is it's a free gift but it didn't it wasn't free for you you're a loving father and you've given everything and I make the mistake sometimes because I get so physical that I look at the gaps and I go what's wrong what's God trying to teach me What's God trying to get through to me? And it's, sometimes it's because I'm watching for you in the physical instead of listening for you in the spirit. And I need to doodle a little more often instead of always having the answer. Give me humility and empathy. Shut my mouth once in a while. It would be to my advantage, and I know you won't shut it. I'm just asking you to help me tune my ear to when I should. So I don't want to descend into the chaos where I mistake you not doing something for your disapproval or you're not doing something for your hatred for me. And I believe that, Father, this message was meant not just for this room, but for the many people around the world who might benefit from it. And I pray that we've helped start a revolution. I know that's big. That's heady. Who are we? But the word works. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name.